With the gaming world in an uproar over the release of the PS5 Pro prices and some excellent titles hitting us last month, October doesn't seem like it's about to stop. There's a lot in line with the Halloween theme, but we're gonna avoid most of them. Here is our team's pick for October. Silent Hill 2 Considered by many to be the crown jewel of the horror genre, I'll be the first to admit I had more than a fair amount of skepticism when they released the teaser trailer for this game. More so when they dropped the combat trailer for it. I mean, this is Silent Hill, a psychological horror game. The focus isn't and really shouldn't be on the combat. Silent Hill was the atmosphere of the town. The figuring out how to proceed forward the many mysterious characters you meet, and wondering what incarnation you were fighting against. And this was what was showcased on the around 30 minutes of gameplay footage via VGC. The exploration, the puzzles, the enemies, and one very famous scene of you putting your hand into a disgusting toilet bowl for a key. And you know what? This was what the fans were looking for. Admittedly, there's still a part of me that's kinda iffy on this release. It's just that Silent Hill 2 has a lot to live up to, especially with the gold standard for remakes being that of the Resident Evil franchise. A huge question is whether they can actually capture the mystique of the original, since a lot of us know how it goes already. Thankfully, we can already kinda see the changes to the flow of the gameplay, like James actually finding the radio, a key item, in a completely different location. There's more buildings to explore, different puzzles and different enemy locations, all indicating we might be in for a few surprises again. Silent Hill 2, I'm curious to see how much you can tempt us to visit that fogful town once again. Sonic X Shadow Generations is a game of two parts. It's more accurate to say it's a bundle of two games. A remastered Sonic Generations and a new campaign involving Shadow called Shadow Generations, running parallel to the events Sonic & Co go through. While we don't have a full view of the story at the moment, the basic gist involves a villain called the Time Eater, tearing a hole in the fabric of reality sending our heroes into levels from their past. On the Sonic side of things, we get remastered cutscenes, graphics, performance, as well as changes to the control side of things. You have the option to go back to the older form of controls or the more recent Sonic Frontier control set. Likewise, both classic and modern Sonic get the drop dash. On the shadow side of things, the antagonist is the returning Black Doom, who is attempting to rewrite history so that Shadow does not end up defeating him. Unlike Sonic, Shadow does not get the drop dash, getting instead Doom powers which will allow him to fly, surf, and traverse environments, along with his chaos powers, including the signature Chaos Control, to stop time and perhaps find tricky shortcuts in the route he traverses. It's been a while since Sonic Team had a win on their hands, but fans are excited for this release. Let's hope the Shadow content is enough for this remaster of an entry that the fans already love. Dragon Age The Veil Card, formerly known as Dreadwolf, is the highly anticipated fourth entry into the Dragon Age universe. I say anticipated, but its first trailer left a lot of fans scratching their heads as the tone and style shifted drastically from the darker themes we were used to. Gameplay reveals and previews afterwards have assuaged much of the dread fans had, though we're still wondering whether this is the Dragon Age we signed up for. On the story side of things, it is very much so, as we continue off after 8 years from the prequel DLC on the footsteps of Solus, our elven god and expert mage on the Fade. Our new limited player character, Rook, manages to interrupt the ritual by Solus to tear down the whale, to some horrific consequences, and now it's up to Rook and some familiar faces to fix the situation or at least attempt to fix it as best as they can. The player character Rook still retains much of his customization, allowing you to specialize among the three of Warrior, Major, and Thief, with further options available in the form of race and faction. Relinquishing much of the CRPG formula the old games were known for, the Veilguard opts instead for a real-time combat system where you are in the thick of things. You still have a decent amount of control over your own skills and that of your party members thanks to a pausing raid only of sorts, but it's definitely not that full control we're used to. Rook and Co. will then jump into combat via a hub world, the lighthouse, with the game foregoing the more open world nature of the previous games 
For a more mission-based structure, Bioware has a lot on their plate with their previous failed entries. Here's hoping that Dragon Age The Whale Guard delivers for fans both old and new. At the Xbox Game Showcase of 2023, Atlas announced a new game from the creators of Persona. It wasn't Persona 6, which I was hoping for, but a new high fantasy game which looked very different from it, called Metaphor Re Fantasio. What a name. The game is set in the United Kingdom of Ukronia, where the assassination of the king triggers widespread chaos and unrest. This turmoil ultimately leads to a global tournament being organized to determine the rightful heir to the throne. Something I'm really looking forward to in Metaphor are the UI and its menu animations. People who have played Atlas's previous games will know what I'm talking about. It's so stylish and smooth. Even Yoko Taro, the guy behind the Nier series, complimented it. Shoji Meguro, meanwhile, is the one helming the music this time, the same composer from Persona 3, 4, and 5, so I have no doubt that the soundtrack will be good. But the thing is, Metaphor is a very different game when compared to Persona. Persona takes place in a real world, while Metaphor takes place in this fantasy world. What I'm trying to say is that the context and genre of music will be different from Metaphor. From the trailers, it looks like they're going for an orchestral music with the choir. I haven't listened to an orchestral song composed by Meguro, so I don't quite know what to expect, but the music in the trailer sounds great. Even our editor praised the music. Well, now I know who to blame if it isn't great. I'm gonna wait until I can get my hands on the physical version of the game. I want that cover art, you see? There's a certain charm in the cover, and it looks so cool that a physical version is a must. It has been 17, yes, 17 years since the release of Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 3. In that time, wars have begun and ended, presidents have risen and fallen, and a generation of kids grew up calling our boy Goku from Fortnite. But somehow, unexpectedly, we're back, baby. Sparking Zero is Budokai Tenkaichi 4 in all but name, and I am hyped. Let me talk about my favorite thing about this game. It's not the fact that the animations are the best they've ever been, it's not that the roster is one of the biggest, if not THE biggest, fighting game rosters ever, it's not even that the environments are more destructive than ever before, nor is it the fact that it features a story mode that lets us relive our favorite moments from Dragon Ball. It is the fact that despite the new levels not supporting coach co-op due to the work the game has to do to render the environment destruction, the developers went out of their way to enable coach co-op for the one level where the environment destruction engine is not hard at work, a hyperbolic time chamber. This team gave us so much content and then added couch co-op where they could. You could be playing Dragon Ball with your friends on the couch game, just like old times. If this isn't a labor of love for the fans, I don't know what is. I've been singing the praises of Sparking Zero since its announcement. Every new character reveal has only gotten me more excited. If this game delivers, it'll be an easy game of the year for me. And those are our picks for the month of October. Comment below to let us know what your pick is, but before you run off and do so, here are our bonus picks. Yeez Nordix, or Yeez 10, is a continuation of the adventures of our red-haired Grug, Adol Christian. Instead of putting us into the shoes of an older adult, this time we meet him in his younger days as he travels to the Obelia Gulf, an area taking inspiration from the Vikings. Unlike the older games, Nordix forgoes the party system and instead opts for a dual party and dual protagonist system with the inclusion of the princess Karja Balta. Both Adol and Karja are seemingly tethered together as they proceed with this adventure, with the combat system focusing on you controlling both of them at the same time. In addition to this dual party system, Nordix includes a new sea battle system as you, for the first time, sail around on your ship and battle against enemies with it. Yeez is one of those games which is like comfort food to me. You enjoy the anime -like story and the amazing combat and you always come out wanting more. Neva is the next big game from the creators of Greece. In this entry, you take control of the young woman Alba as you travel together with the wolf pup Neva across beautifully drawn landscapes of color and puzzles once again. And this time around, you also have to fend yourself against enemies with Alba's needle sword, and as the game goes on, we see a larger Neva jumping into the fray. 
There's honestly very little we know about the game at the moment, but if it's anything like Greece, you're going to end up with a heart-wrenching, if not beautiful tale. Life is Strange Double Exposure is the next entry into Don't Nod Entertainment's adventure series. Surprisingly, while the later releases have opted to go for new characters and new settings, Double Exposure puts you back into the shoes of Max Caulfield, the main character of the first game. Despite swearing to never use her rewind powers again after the events of that game, the death of a close friend motivates Max to well use it, only to discover that her powers have sort of evolved so that she can travel to alternate timelines. Now it's up to Max to attend to the problem and learn the insights of the people she knows in both timelines. Also, she can unravel the murder mystery. Clock Tower Rewind is a remastered version of the classic point-and-click horror adventure, Clock Tower. No, not that one. We actually never got the first game. That one is actually Clock Tower 2 in Japan. Although the details are again sparse, if you want, the Rewind version actually allows you to play the Super Famicom release as it was with no change. But I think a lot of us will go for the Rewind side of things, which adds in more cutscenes and encounters that were cut from the original due to production constraints. More weapons, more places for you to hide, and even new animations. I remember the older Clock Tower games quite fondly for stressing me out, which might be an odd thing to say, but regardless I'm looking forward to the actual first game of the series. Unknown 9 Awakening is a new action-adventure game by the equally new Reflector Entertainment. As we approach the release, I must admit that the game lacks that polish that a lot of us go for. But there is one thing I am fascinated by in the premise, and that's the fact that your character Haruna is a psychic. Of course, like any other game with psychic powers, you can throw objects, block projectiles, grab people, and rip their souls out. out. But no, what has my interest is the protagonist's ability to control their enemies. Aruna can step into a foe, pausing time, to then move those enemies and use their abilities to attack each other. Returning back to herself restores time and you watch it all play out like some kind of evil overlord. Well, there's still some jank and we really don't know whether this stepping ability will outweigh its welcome. Color me intrigued. And with that, here's Mika signing off for the month. Thank you.